my favorite. It's Judd's Hockey Show. And it is Judd's Hockey Show. Oh, my God. So much to talk about. So much to bag on with that absolutely pathetic, disgusting performance by the Wild uh, in Dallas tonight. But before we start Judd's Hockey Show, Judd and A.J. Fred Fredrickson with you as always. Um, after games, uh, I want to shout out one good thing, and that is the opportunity to lose weight for the new year at Livia Weight Control Centers. That is right. First three months are free if you join now, and they're also offering a breakthrough uh, weight loss medication options. 855-GO-L-I-V-E-A, Livia.com, Livia, L-I-V-E-A.com. They're going to help you drop the unwanted pounds. All right. Let's get to it. That was seven to two. So the Wild gets swept by Dallas. They lose in three games. They lose them all. They lose eight to three in Dallas in November. They lose on Monday at home for nothing, and then they lose a seven two in Jesper Wallstead's first um, National Hockey League start. He was he did not have a great night, but he is not anywhere near where AJ. I think we should start. I think we should start with what was just a pathetic lack luster no show performance i thought monday was bad but at least the wild came out monday and they were aggressive um tonight i thought they had they popped up when they got the two man and it was a two man advantage uh in the third period for about four maybe if i'm being kind five minutes besides that this was a complete no show this was a team i know they've got guys out i do not care um the most passion i saw all night was not a goal. It was when Brock Faber was so pissed off, he broke his stick on the bench. Other than that, I saw a lot of lollygagging. I saw lazy back checks. I saw a Dallas team that's good, but that means that you have to keep up a little bit. And I saw a wild team, AJ, that I thought quit early, quit often, and made no attempt to, once Dallas started to score, made absolutely no attempt with a rookie goaltender in net. To help him out. I thought this was absolutely abysmal and pathetic. I don't know if there is even an answer to this other than the fact that I just hope that this team goes away. Take the draft pick, get the season done with, and go away. That was absolutely inexcusable tonight. I can't think of any excuse. I feel bad for Jasper Wallstead. You know, I would like to think that uh, playing in front of Marc-Andre Fleury, trying to get him to the second all-time for uh, NHL all-time goalie wins is enough to kickstart the team. They start strong the other night, just declining, declining, declining. Gets worse by the period. All right, you know what? You have bad games. You have, you know what? I can maybe look the other way. And then you call up your top prospect. Jesper Waltz, that 20th overall, he is by all means the complete package for a goaltender. First game in the NHL, he gets the nod. You're going to enemy territory down in Dallas, a team that's had your number that knocked you out of the playoffs last year. Oh, Judd, we're going to get fired up. We're going to play for this kid, right? Right? No, nope. it's the whole thing. Absolutely not. No fight. I don't understand how you're going to just go out there and go through the motions for 60 minutes. Like you said, we maybe saw five, six minutes of passionate hockey from this Minnesota wild club tonight. Other than that, everything else was just so lackluster. I don't, I, and I, I'm going to cede to your point now, a couple weeks in a row, future captain Brock favor. He's the yeah. only one that I, sh he's the only one showing emotion out there, breaking his $300 piece of carbon fiber, <laughs> on the bench and boy like that th that's the only like spark i saw he's he's over there snapping twigs and you know rightfully so he's upset he just missed a chance they go back the other way 30 seconds later and they score but everything about this game tonight was just so frustrating they just didn't try they they from the from the jump it seemed like they were like well all right hey we're here and wallstead's gonna you know he's gonna have his showing and i want to say it wasn't it wasn't a game to remember that's for sure but oh, he no. did but he yeah. did look for a guy starting in his first career nhl game and i'm sure we'll talk about this more he didn't look bad there was like it could well, have been a, for two periods yeah. i thought for two periods in the first period he actually looked i i liked how he played his angles i liked how he played the third period was just a a, a debacle but i mean so here are your uh, six defensemen who played for the wild tonight okay 
John Merrill, minus three. Jake Middleton, minus two. Dakota Mermis, minus three. Brock Faber, who didn't play a great game, but at least he cares, minus two. Zach Bogosian, minus one. Alex Golgoski, minus one. And and here's so here's my problem, too. So when you're dealing, so you've got a goaltender ma making his first start, and you've got Faber, who clearly passionately cares, probably been struggling a little bit more of late, to be expected, not surprising. Um, but let's go back to the first goal. So so the Wild actually, because this easily could have been 8-2, to two, the Wild caught a break when when the uh, first goal by the Stars was ruled to be offside. Okay, so you catch a break. 0-0. Zero, zero. Then the first goal at 16.45 of the first period by Joe Pavelski comes off a lazy, bad pass from Matt Zuccarello. Matt Zuccarello, who, you know, is, is a top-line guy for you, who you're counting on to make smart plays, right? Coming out of his own zone, Matt Zuccarello tries to throw the puck, tries to make a, as I tweeted, Nick Mullins pass. Pavelski <laughs> picks it right off and goes in and scores. You know, when, when that's the tone you're setting, when, when the tone that you set is essentially that, that type of pass, you get what you deserve. And and this team, you know, now, which, and I, I've seen this, well, they don't match up with the Stars. It's one thing not to match up with a team and to lose. It's another to roll over and basically be a bunch of dogs. And that's what they were. I can't articulate enough. We have seen the majority of the last six periods of hockey we've seen is inexcusable. And look, I am now, and I think, I think we all probably are on, you know, bandwagon draft pick, Get in the lottery, try your luck, right? Mm -hmm. But okay, so you so you're without Kaprizov, you're without Spurgeon, you're without Brooke Brody, and you're without Gustafson. You're gonna lose games. I get that, but it's how you lose. And tonight and Monday, for the most part, at home, how you lost was embarrassingly lethargic. And you know, this was what changed and was what was supposed to change when Everson got fired. And it did change. They were 11-3 and three in John Hines' first 14 games. But this is, I, I'm sorry. And I saw I saw a tweet tonight that this might cause, you know, this might be cause for a closed door meeting in the room after the game. <laughs> so sick of that. What are you going to do? What are you going to do at this point other than pull your collective heads out of your collective behinds and actually play. And yes, yes, the Taylor Heisey goal tonight is the best goal that you will see in professional hockey. No National Ho Hockey League player will top that goal tonight. Her goal against, I believe it was Toronto at the X, yes. was absolutely a thing of beauty. I take full credit because on our show today, I had predicted in Write That Down that she would, or that, that, um, that the, Minnesota Blanks P PWHL team would win their first game and that Heisey would score a goal and she didn't. And so on Mackie and Judd, write that down. I said, this is a huge disappointment. How does the <laughs> first pick in the draft not score a goal? And then she clearly a fan of our show shut me up. So good, good for you, Taylor. That's awesome. But yeah, this was, uh, I I'm sorry. I, you know, nobody deserves to watch what we watched tonight. It was absolute garbage. Um, and, and it's really, really sad because this reminds me a lot of the type of garbage that we saw at times when number 20 on the Dallas stars was wearing number 20 for the wild. Yeah. Um, I, I, I if you're in the chat, definitely keep us updated on the PWHL Minnesota score. If they do close out that game to improve the three, and zero against Toronto, I know, uh, they're looking to stay undefeated, but, uh, to the wild team tonight, it's, it, it this is like mid 2010 days like you said it's it's just i'm not it, it seems like there is something wrong in the locker room but i don't want to hear about how there is something closed door um it, like this season is lost and you have to accept that but you at least have to have a little pride and uh, show a little effort if you're going to go out there and lose that's that's what i'm this for a team that has a lot of veteran presence on it mm -hmm. there are some very important youngsters on this team as well and those older guys need to show, hey, 
even when your back's up against the wall and maybe you're you're down and out and you're getting kicked in the gut a couple times, you need to stand back up and have a little pride. Wipe the wipe the blood from your mouth, put your fist back up, even if you're going to get knocked back down right again. And we we saw them get knocked down seven times tonight. You got to get back up. You got to get back up and show a little bit of fight. Um, it's the two the two goals they scored. <sighs> consolation like one was a it was off of Baldy. off a rear end for boldy and then he off he, his jersey yeah unbelievable and then the other one was on a five on three okay what do you do you should you should score off there. a pass from zookie who loves to pass five <laughs> on three you could pass the puck five on three to set up a goal yeah <laughs> after he made that terrible pass and again to me that set a tone because if he's going to make that stupid a play then you know who who else and what was the goal i've got this in my notes as well um, so the, the third Dallas goal in the second period by hints, um, was that the one that came on? Oh no, no, I'm sorry. The Lundquist goal in the third per- period came on, uh, uh, Mermis blind pass out of his own zone. That got, of course got picked off. Like, yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> like, I know that you're a young player yourself, Dakota, but what are you, what are are we doing here and credit the one it's unfortunate that that had to be seen by a national TV audience on TNT. But the one thing I will say is the TNT guys do a great job of breaking down the actual game and replays and they actually share what's going wrong, which I, which I love because it's like, Oh, okay, that makes sense. And, and then they show a replay. So um this is just if this was a one off, I guess I would be like, OK, that's it's disappointing, but it it is what it is. But when you're playing like you did on Monday and, you know, again, you get shut up by this team at home. Now, at that point, you've been outscored by them on the season 12 to three. And this is your response. And I don't care who's in goal, but I mean, you got a kid in goal. So it would be nice to give him. And, and he did. I mean, to your point, through two periods, he deserved far better. Yes. He deserved far more. Um, and instead you looked like, you know, you just look like the San Jose Sharks. You, you're just an embarrassment t- to yourself. And, and I'd call for something, but I don't even know. Here's a problem, AJ. I don't even know what to call for at this, this point. Other than the fact that frustration is because of all those stupid, no move and no trade clauses, it's hard to move people. But um, I don't know what else you, you could do. You've changed coaches. You have, you know, so now if you want to shake up the room, <laughs> you are very, very limited because you've given these no move and no trade cl- clauses out like they're candy. Now, Zuccarello, I think, has 10 teams. I, I He's a guy I'd love to trade. Um, he's got 10 teams to which he can block trade. So it's not a complete no move, no trade clause. Um, but I mean... At this point in time, and I know Kaprizov's going to come back, and I know Spurgeon's going to come back, and I know Brodeen is going to, to come back, and that will help. But at this point in time, I would punt. I I would do what the Vikings didn't do. We, we now have the Vikings of 2023 yes. uh, to use as an example. I don't care who's coming back. I don't care when. Bail. And and when I say bail, I mean bail. If this is what it's going to be, then spend the rest of this year and next year while, while you're in – I, you know, salary cap hell. It mm-hmm. won't be as bad because the cap will go up a little bit next year. But you know, if you're going to be in salary cap hell in 2022, 20 or 23, 24, or salary cap purgatory in 2024, 25, start moving what you can. Mm-hmm. I, I said today with um, with Dex and Jesse Pierce on the show that, that we taped that you could catch at Score North. I said I would seriously consider trying to trade Gustafson. Because he has no protection, and I would play Wallstead and Flurry, unless you're convinced you're going to ruin Wallstead. Like unless you're convinced he's going to go completely in the toilet. Um, Let me ask you this then, quick, because Jacob, if you're not, yeah, Jacob uh, in the chat wants to know: should, Would and this is I want to hear your take. I have an opinion on this as well, but uh, Wallstead, he thinks he shouldn't play again. Uh, just for his own sanity. And I'm sure there's a little jest in that as well, but uh, do you think you limit was this mistake playing Jesper Wallstead tonight, or do you think you just continue to get him out there, get him minutes and uh, whatever the decision is, it, it is. Well, I think as soon as Gustafson's back, he's gone again, he's going back down. I mean, we know for a fact that their goal was to not play him this season with the big club. If they didn't have to, 
they unfortunately for them did. But I'm not too concerned. I, I Look, if you can't take a night like this and you're a goaltender, and as they talked about on the TNT telecast tonight, he was in the he was in like the highest Swedish league at the age of 17. And that's some good hockey. I'm mm-hmm. sure he took some lumps there. Um, I'm not suggesting it's a good idea. And I, I am all for not psychologically ruining a goaltender. But I also don't think that that this is it. Um, but I do think that you have to consider, as John just said on our uh, on our message board there, sell, sell, sell. I think you got to sell what you can. And, you know, and I don't want to hear it's the same Justin Jefferson crap. I don't want to hear, well, Kirill's going to leave for sure then. Well, if Kirill has to watch the crap you watch tonight, he's going to leave too. He's going to leave that, you know. So you've got to look for solutions here. And I'm sorry, but this team, um, they've got some good young talent. I really think that they'll be fine eventually, but it's going to be a couple of years. And I'm telling you right now, it bothers me, though, that in a room that had or, it, you know, a room and a team on the ice that had Felino on the ice tonight, Hartman, Zuccarello, a lot of uh, Goudreau, a lot of vets. That was the effort. That's pretty, pretty sad. Yeah, the effort level is a concern. Um, and I do want to address maybe concern from some fans that are thinking, oh, they just ruined Wallstead. It was such a disastrous mistake. You can fire everybody. Take a deep breath. This is this yeah, is I this. Agree. I know he's a young kid, but take a deep breath. He's looking, and his goal and his aspirations are to play in the National Hockey League. People have withstood a lot more adversity in this league than a debut disaster like we saw tonight. If and frankly, I want to say if this is what breaks him mentally, he's, he's not, not the goalie for the Wild for the future. No, you know exactly right. So exactly if, right. If, if that's what it is, then then by all means then maybe, yeah, maybe he's not the guy. I am 100% certain that is not the case. He's going to be just fine, and I'm sure that he's going to go back into the locker room, be PO'd about it, and then he's on the on the flight home. He's going to be sitting next to Marc-Andre Fleury saying, hey, getting coached, what what, what would you do after a night like this? How like how do you do this if, you, if this happens again? Yeah. How to make sure that this doesn't happen again when yeah. I get a chance? I do want to say I didn't think that they should have started him tonight in Dallas and maybe that was just the the fatigue aspect for flurry saying hey I just can't go tonight I would have liked to see him either Friday or Saturday against in my opinion lesser teams you probably um, will too I or you will for sure because they're, yeah. they're not gonna have him play back they're, oh no you know if if Gus is not back yet and I don't think he's going to be back by the weekend flurry's not gonna start against the Flyers and Coyotes so yeah I just think that this is a circumstance thing and I also think that you have to look at it. If they started Wallstead game after game after game, you I'm sure you could do some damage, right? Yeah. But I'm with you. You're not going to w- one game and if he if he can't take that, then you're also right. He's not your goaltender. So, look, that's not my problem, but I'll tell you this, I, I, with the way things are going, I'd give I'd give thought to try to trade Gustafson. Because goaltending is so volatile, yeah. I'd bring I'd bring good old McIntyre back up and say, "Go to it, man! You get shelled, you get shelled." I don't, you know, these guys don't deserve more than that. This team doesn't deserve more than that. Yep. You know, if if your if your quote unquote culture guys are gonna play like they did tonight, they don't deserve anything. They certainly don't deserve, uh, you know, playoff type. I, I mean. It's embarrassing. You've got key guys out. So it's time to step up. And this is what you get. Because this was a no-show. And most of Monday was a no-show. Big difference between seeing a game in which you're like, okay, they tried, just not that good. And that type of, of I don't even want to call it an effort. It does that word a disservice. But, yeah, put trade Gustafson. Yep. If Flurry wants to stay. If Flurry wants out, I don't blame him. And then I would accommodate him as well. But if he wants to stay, trade Gus, bring McIntyre up, send Wallstep back down and say, hey, dude gives up 10 goals. That's on you guys because you're going to get exactly what you deserve. But the worst thing, the worst thing this team could do now is start to get guys back and pull the same stunt that they pulled when Hines got the job and be like, oh, we're back. We're back. No, you're not. You're not back. You're not that good. Buzz off. 
Yeah. I mean, look, to use your your point, look at the Vikings. If they had lost one more game, they're drafting sixth instead of 11th. And in the NFL draft, that is massive. The yep. Wild had a bad start. We, we've seen them have a little bit of resurgence, a la the Vikings, like 5-0 and run after that after that 1-4 and start. Um, now we're, we're seeing the slump again. The worst thing that can happen is that they go out and start winning games again and go on that resurgence once again, and they, you know, they're the gritty Minnesota Wild, and they're, yeah, every game's a playoff game. No, just no. The season is lost. Start taking stock of what you can actually move. I know it's not a lot of guys. I know it's not. There's a lot of no move no move clauses. A lot of guys are protected, but to your point, Gustafson, I think is the top name teams need goaltending. You're not, I'm not expecting anything massive, but you're good. Really anything at this point to essentially you're it's a pro pro, it's a, it's a win-win because you're moving a guy who is a good goaltender. I think when healthy and can win you games. So that's going to take away that aspect for when you inevitably have to start him. And then you're getting a return. Some team that is a contender that needs goaltending will give you something. It's not going to oh, be yeah. a blockbuster, but if the Flyers can trade a guy, and granted, this is a completely different circumstance, in Cotter Gautier, who didn't want to even play for them, and it was a well kept enough secret amongst the league that they were able to get a guy like Jamie Drysdale in return, you can get you can get something for a goaltender. You can get something for a solid goaltender. Or just yeah, I, what what I would try and, and do because there there are going to be three or four teams handful probably that could use goaltending as the playoff approaches. Um, I would try and do what Garen did in the Blackhawks trade for flower, which is that was, I think a second round pick a conditional first. If the, I think it was the wild made the Western conference finals, you know? So if I trade you Gustafson, I'd put a condition on it. Now it might not be a first round pick. It might be a conditional second, but the reality with Gustafson is this, he's not going to be your primary goaltender when, when you come back up. It's going to be Wallstead. So that type of thing makes sense. I mean, I would love, and you just sent him to an extension, but I mean, I would love to trade Zuccarello if I could. I think he could help a team. I would love to try and trade Hartman, who has a no trade, but as as was pointed out to me on Twitter today, and I think the person might be right, I don't know that his no move clause kicks in until the extension does next year. So I don't know that, that he's afforded the protection yet. Now they probably would say, well, yeah, but we just gave him the protection. We can't do that. I, you know, but if you're going to perform like you did tonight, you get no grace from me. You get no, oh yeah, you know what? You're a team guy. Forget that. Um, so yeah, I, I'm very frustrated by, by this, but I think if you're a wild fan and you're not, you're absolutely crazy. Um, and yes, JJ, if they don't care about trying to win, which is debatable right now. Flurry deserves another chance at a cup. That's got to be his call, though. We, we talked about this after the game on Monday, Age. If Mark andre Flurry, I think you got to approach him and say, what do you want? And if he's like, my family's here, I'm happy here, this is going to, to be it, but I've won three cups, I'm cool here, then, then you actively pursue trying to trade um, Gustafson. But yeah, Flower gets to make his call. This comment, Age, I like a lot. Natalie mm-hmm. says Faber gives the quote. I want to carry this team vibes. Absolutely. He he's a captain. Yes. He's, he's captain material. And you know, we've, well, as you know, I'm not a Koivu guy. That's not a secret. <laughs> um, Spurgeon. I like, and I do think he's a solid, I mean, I don't think he's because of his size, you know, he's not gonna, he, he is who he is. I'll put it very nicely, but the reality with him as a captain is it's always been, well, he, you know, he encourages players on the bench. He's great. Blah, blah, blah. Brock Faber, man. I love the stick. I love breaking the stick. At least show me you're pissed off. At least show me you care. And he genuinely cares. Like that's not a for show thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yes, I think that Natalie's exactly right. Like, I think he wants to be the straw that stirs the drink type of guy. And the thing I really like about him too, is you can tell, Again, when they get back up, which might be two years, but when this team gets back up, he's going to be a force. We're we're going to see Brock in about fifteen years, and he's going to be starting to go a little gray. That 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 baby fat in the face be gone, right? Yeah, chisel. And he's going to and he's going to have some you know some some scars, and he's still going to be playing, and he's going to be kicking people's asses, and 
And we're going to say, hey, pull up those pictures of Brock when he joined the, you know, and he's, remember the he's, picture of him banging on the glass? Do you remember Brent Trump? Burns? When yeah. Brent Burns came up, biggest, I co covered that team. Brett Burns had the, you know, big time baby face, looked like he was 12 years old, and then he grew the beard and all that. Faber might not grow that beard, but he's going to be chiseled. He's going to be a great, you know, he's going to have been around for a long time. I, I'm guessing he wins at least one, if not a couple, Norris trophies. So, Natalie, you're exactly right. I want to touch on a few more things before we uh, wrap here, Age. Yeah. Um, first of all, this league and the officiating. Um, and there's something tonight that really bugged me, and it went both ways, and it had nothing to do with the result of the game. But it continues to be a problem, and it's why guys get hurt. On what became, which, hold on a second here. I can't keep the Dallas goal straight because they scored so many damn goals <laughs> tonight. But on what, on the, on one of the Dallas goals, um, it was right after or right when around at the same time Faber hit, hit the post, which I think would have made it two to one. So I think it was the third goal. Um, if you go back to that goal in front of the net, Middleton had pinched in in front of the Dallas net and Suter came behind him and cross-checked him hard. And Middleton went down and was hurt and it should have been called. He had to sort of, I don't know, limp is the right word, but he got himself off the ice slowly. Dallas oh, comes yes. down okay, and scores. I remember what you're talking about. Dallas yeah. comes down and scores. It, 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 it was basically the same crap that Suter pulled with Kaprizov in the playoffs last year, okay? But then here's my problem with it. So they don't call that. No one says a thing. Mm -hmm. Later, Middleton, to exact his pound of flesh, um, cross-checks um, Sagan near the end boards in the wild zone. And it's a hard cross-check. It, it should have been a penalty. Furthermore, it was a cross-check that Sagan was sort of in between that that. He's in the zone. danger zone. The danger zone, right. So he's not up against the boards. So he falls forward. And God forbid, if he had been a little bit closer, he would have smacked his head, which, you know, can lead to neck problems, certainly concussions. This is the type of stuff they've got to call. This type, this type of stuff they have to see both ways, too. I, that that third goal never should have counted for Dallas because that was a penalty on Suter, who, just to be very clear here, and yes, I don't like him, but that's not the point here. Just to be very clear, Ryan Suter is known for that crap. Like, and he did it here too. We just ignored it. But, you know, the officials should not be like, what? Oh, we missed that. Ryan Suter did it. That's what he, that's, that's one of his go-to moves. And I absolutely hate this crap because it's how we get into trouble with this sport. That type of stuff, there's nothing good from it. The Middleton cross check on Sagan. Sagan's mm -hmm. a really good player. Kaprizov's a really good, right? You want to see, I'm sorry, I want to see those guys play. I don't want to see him carried off the ice. And, you know, Suter, a notorious cheap shotter when it comes to that exact thing, including on Kaprizov, he started it. Middleton wanted to finish it. But when we have these discussions about guys being hurt and what should be called and shouldn't be called, I'm sorry, but if you're looking at the puck and you're the official, and a guy goes like this to a guy, which is something they were supposed to crack down on like three years ago or four years ago. What are we doing here? Why are we not calling that? Why didn't we call Suter for it? So then you don't necessarily get Middleton trying to get his revenge. I believe it was our in-building colleague, Chris Long of KSTP Channel 5, who put this out. I want to say it was the day or two after the Kaprizov injury. Mm -hmm. what they have in professional lacrosse is the role that if you're going to make a, a contact like that, your hands have to be together. They can't be separated on the stick. They have to be sure. together because there's, because then there's just no cross check to begin with. The cross check is eliminated. Something like that has to be what's implemented. We just got done watching the IHA, uh, IIHF world junior championships. Were there some questionable calls in that, uh, that maybe, we're a little too rash sending off. Uh, uh, I want to say it's Connor geeky. I know he's got an older brother. I want to say it's Morgan. So I think it's Connor yep. geeky get, that got sent off 17 yep. seconds in to a pretty important game for team Canada. Yes. I don't think he should have got sent off for that, but I would say I would rather have, and maybe this is an unpopular opinion. I would rather have the NHL 
and their referees be a little more whistle happy for the sake of protecting the players. The old time, you know, I'm seeing it in the, in the, in the chat here of giving some guys a lumber. The days of that, I think are gone. You shouldn't have to do that. Uh, we, I had a conversation with, uh, with our friend Ross Brendel in the office today. And he, you know, he gave me his shtick about, uh, when he's the governor of Minnesota, where anybody that fights on a hockey game, they're going to yeah, prison. Yeah. If you can't do it in a bar, you can't, do, well, you have to police the game, but I, in a Correct. sense, I wouldn't tell, I'm not going to say this to his face. In a sense, he's kind of right. If the referees do their job correctly, then all this officiating, protecting the game, policing the game themselves isn't as big of a factor. They should be able to monitor the game for the player's safety, for the player's health. The Sagan one is unbelievable that that, that didn't get called. There was a yeah. whistle. It took me a minute to realize that there was no penalty I and that the puck too. just went up and out of play. Yep. 100%. That, that was insane. Middleton needs to go to the box for that. That is blatant. It's dangerous. It's reckless. It it it's it looks intentional because it is. Mm-hmm. I'm all for you. I understand evening up. So I'm not going to say that Jake Middleton is a, you know, is a goon. He's not. You know, he's. Not, I'm not going to no, say he's, he's a dirty mad. player. He's mad because he's, they he didn't they didn't make the call exactly. But it shouldn't have happened in the first place to him with him limping off to the bench. Shouldn't have been a goal. Do I think that changes the like the outcome of this game? No, not at all. This team did not play. Oh, well no. Enough. no, no. I'm just, I think, I think yes. what it does is it adds to the problem that the game has. And then when a person gets hurt badly, you know, we talk about it. We're like, well, what could be done to prevent this? Well, you could call Suter. Again, if you watch Ryan Suter play, this is what he does. You call it for him. You could call that on him five times per game, which I'd love to see. But I mean, we are, you know, this league is so fixated on if I come close age to chopping your hands, right? Like if mm-hmm. you're going through the, if you're going through the neutral zone and my stick touches your gloves, I get called for a slash and I get why they yeah. want to put teams on power plays. But if you're going to, but if you're like got a eagle eye out for that, how do you not have an eagle eye out for when I am purposely trying to hurt a guy? Yes. Um. But, but then what's so frustrating is, so no one got hurt. Everyone will go, go home now, yeah. and that series of plays will be forgotten until somebody gets cross-checked from behind tomorrow night, and they get hurt badly, and now we're like all on our soapbox about how could you let this happen? Mm. Well, allowing this to happen tonight leads to more problems, and I just think as far as the what the referees need to do, policing the game, and they were supposed to crack down on cross-checks, and they did. And if I crossed you, if, if I cross-check you now in front of the net, I will get called for it. Yeah. But, you know, the it's ridiculous. Fine. Yeah, but and like you said, what's really ridiculous is it's the danger zone. That's the last place. I would rather you cross-check me in front of the net so I fall forward, but I'm not falling into something. Um, so that's my rant on, on that. I do have some good really, news here. Really quick yeah. before you get to the good news, um, I put up J11s here. I just want to clarify. I'm not, I'm not anti-fighting altogether or big hits altogether. It's just... It, I feel like they're doing it at times for the wrong reasons and it's preventable. That's, that's mm-hmm. all like the, the policing, the game doesn't need to be as apparent as it, as we've seen, even this season, I'm all for, I understand the fighting and big hits do belong in hockey. There is a place for it. I think um, yeah. it's just been a little bit too prevalent here. Anyways, uh, I want to hear some good news though. The good news is this, the Minnesota PWHL team three Toronto one. As, I mean. as you like to say, <laughs> this club's a wagon. This club is a wagon. Uh, let's see here. First period goal, Taylor Heisey. Let's continue to scroll here. Can I, uh, can I, can I get out in front of um, a, maybe a, a nickname for her really quick? Sure. sure. Uh, you remember, remember, and this is not going to surprise given my opinion, uh, my appearance, excuse me. But uh, do you remember at McDonald's, they used to have this like high C, like fruit punch orange thing? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, call her Taylor High C because she's got the juice. This she is a phenomenal oh, wow. hockey player. Oh wow, she's incredible. So, so she scored again in the second period, Ooh. and then Kendall Coyne Schofield uh, scored in the third. Yes, the Toronto goal coming from the fantastic Sarah Nurse, who is also great on TV as well as a great player. Um, all right, last thing from me is this. You know I don't like the name the Wild. The jerseys they wore tonight don't do much for me. Mm-hmm. The home greens I really don't like. But 
nothing is worse than what Dallas wore tonight. <laughs> Declan loves them because they're Gen X or, or, or Gen Z or some no. some some wrestling thing. Oh, um, Degeneration X. Degeneration X. Okay. Yeah. They, honest to God, they look like they should shut the lights off and glow in the dark. Like they look like I either think of that or or like a fireman's jacket, right? Like like that has the you know like if you ride your bike at night so you can see. Um, the whole Dallas thing drives me crazy because that's m- my team as a kid. But I think what drives me the most nuts is that I mean, whoever came up with that, one should be fired and those should never be worn again. I think that they you can just disagree have, with me. I just hate no, it. no. I I have I have a huge issue with just their entire branding when they yeah. when, when they rebranded their logo, for instance, from the old stars across to now yep. the D with the the initial. Th- I I hate it for the record. And the original comparisons were that looks like the Starbucks logo, <laughs> like it, it yeah. bad to begin with. They also go from the beautiful North Stars kind of oh yeah brighter green to this like murky it's not a forest green but it's also not like a clover green it's just like it's it's baby poop green maybe like with a little extra neon it i don't know um so that's bad and then you know okay hey we're gonna do a third jersey we're gonna i i think they actually do light up in maybe it's uh maybe it's vegas that did this but like glow in the dark i think that was vegas that's stupid. You, how many are we playing night games here all of a sudden? Did I miss a memo? Oh. Um, these are terrible. They are so ugly. I don't I don't understand how this goes through a design process, yes. a multiple like committee meetings, multiple board meetings. They uh, see the design, they mock up a, a sample, they do like test grouping. It gets through all of that, multiple hoops that we're jumping through. And then gets the final check off. Yep. Hey, let's print it, roll it out. This is what the Dallas Stars are going with. They're a great hockey team. And they right now they own the Minnesota Wild, but they look awful doing it visually. Not hockey-wise. Visually, they look terrible. I agree completely. So if, if you could pull up a comment there from GA007, who we always appreciate the fact that he is uh, tuned in to the show. Absolutely. Is this true? Dallas Stars alternate jersey tonight is voted top five in most lists for favorite alternate jerseys. Are you kidding me? I mean, there are some, first of all, to be very clear, there are some fantastic third jerseys. Like, there are some great, and heck, the Wilds is great, but I mean, there are some other really good ones. Those things are voted top five. Who's voting? I mean, that's absolutely awful. I can't believe that. (laughs) Like, that's one of the worst things I've ever seen. As far as a jersey goes, it's, yeah. you know, there's a lot of sort of objectionable, but you're like, whatever. I mean, I'm watching that thing tonight. I'm like, oh, my God. And I've seen it before. This isn't the first time. But anyway, that's my final thought. I hate the jerseys. All right. Um, the Wild plays home games uh, Friday. I think they got Philadelphia, who, as you talked about, acquired Jamie Drysdale, who's actually going to help their power play quite a bit. I think he had an, at least an assist on a power play goal against Montreal tonight. Yep. And then they've got the uh, upstart, far more uh, plucky Coyotes with Ingram, who's been absolutely great in goal. Um, what's your expectation from here? What do you think happens now? Do you think this team has a, a rally again? Because this has been about – this has been back to about as – dead ass as you can possibly get. I would guess Brodeen or Kaprizov might be back at some point soon. I would just hate to see them pop back up and win and win games. I feel like this team should just lose with some dignity, but I don't, I don't mind the losses. It's how I've seen them of late. Yeah. Um, when they were having that resurgence a couple weeks ago, there was that home and home with the jets. And I think I said like, Two points is the minimum that I'd be okay with, but I'd want to see three. Four would be ecstatic. I'm going to flip that around and go the other way. I don't want more than one point this weekend. You know? I Sure, I want them to try and look good doing it. Right. But, I, I hear you. But at this I point, and I and I and this goes against my, my childhood being because it's always like, oh, they're still in it. They're not mathematically eliminated. You never know what's going to happen. As an adult now, I have to think with my head and not my heart on this one. And my yeah. head says... Go for the draft. Get the higher pick. Think about the lottery here. 
of course, Minnesota, no luck is going to be involved with this. I'm sure they're going to get as high as like four and then somehow get bumped down to, to six if that's the case. But uh, because that, you know, that's absolutely what would happen. But just if the, the you said it earlier, the worst thing that would happen is any sort of st- winning streak now. Because then you're just left in this meddling middle zone where, Fight. you know, you're you're not going to get a great prospect, but it's a guy that's probably going to be a decent like middle six or like a, a second line defenseman who might be solid, but he's not going to be up here for a couple years and you never really are going to know. It's just I, I, the biggest thing is how they lose when they inevitably do. This team is going to lose more games than they win the rest of the season. And as Swerve95 says, We've still got about half the season to go, so buckle up, everybody. It's going to be a, a long home stretch here, but um, you have to do it looking like you care about these games. You have to set an example for the culture that Bill Guerin has yes. on multiple occasions talked about and said that we're building and we're setting in the locker room and amongst the franchise. You right. are doing it for the younger guys in the locker room and just for the sake of – I don't. we just can't check out. You know, this is when it comes to hockey markets, you have your diehards, you have your maybe bigger markets that are a little more casual. This is a at its base. Minnesota is like they're going to see hockey. I understand. Like I've been to a game down in Vegas and it's very it's it's very excited fans down there. And the presentation is more of a like a of a show. And they do it well. I'm not. I, I'm not comparing and saying that it's wrong, um, but it's it's a different viewpoint of how to approach a hockey presentation. And Minnesota, when you're showing up to the X, you're going to watch the game. And you know, like if it, anything else besides that, when they added um, a pre-game light thing on say, the have ice, you, have you been there of late with the DJs during period? I mean, between periods is more is a is more of a circus than the actual game itself. I mean, I feel. I've only been once this year uh, okay, for the home openers. The, so. the DJ fires up for pregame warm-ups. He fires up between the first and second, the second <laughs> and third. They're showing fans, little kids dancing. Guys take their shirts off. It's a circus. But you know what? It's just I can't take I can't take another team doing the roller coaster. <laughs> I can't take another team. Just play with some pride. That's all I'm asking. Yeah. I'm not saying you got to win. Just play with some pride. Mm-hmm. Um I do have a feeling this is going to be another. I do. I feel like this is going to be a long couple of years. I feel yeah. like next year it's going to be bumpy, and then they'll start to come out of it, and they will have good. Like I do like some of the talent. Um, I am getting worried about the culture though, and which is something I was really worried about, obviously with Fletcher, and then Fenton was very quick and he, odd duck. Um, but you know, the one thing I gave Garen a lot of credit for was he seemed to set a culture, but. Um, that culture was has not been there, and you know tonight I didn't see any veteran sort of kick people in the rear end. I saw Brock Faber, which God bless him for it, but that's that shouldn't be his job yet. So, yeah, um, it's like you said, the roller coaster is much fun as in real life. The a lot of ups and down is go on the kiddie coaster where it's low to the ground. All your I, the only up I want to see is when I look at Tankathon and your draft position right now. continues to increase. And if you want to start a uh, you know a, a per show segment of where they sit with the loss, they uh, they're in the seventh position for the draft, barring any movements with the lottery. Projected to draft Caden Lindstrom out of Medicine Hat, the kind of forward Love hybrid. Hat. Yes. Love Medicine Hat, legendary <laughs> hockey talent. You know what though? Get really bad and get me. Celebrini on line two. That's what I want. I want the Celebrini kid. Unbelievable. All right, we're done. Age, thank you much. Um, as always, appreciate you uh, coming to our therapy sessions, which is what this has become post game. Wild shows. Tonight is a debacle. Monday was a debacle, but at least we're here for you. I'm Judd. He's AJ. Talk to you soon.